drink? All alone? How about it? How about a little drink? Looking for somebody? What I do? Buy uh, a little something, maybe. Lonesome? Change your mind? I know a swell place. Nice little bar down the street. Hey! Accident, Fifth and Spring. Possible suicide. No identification. No name. You want a name her? A mystery woman. Maybe she's the daughter of a wealthy herring merchant caught in the web of an international spy ring. She knows five guys in a row. No, oh, lucky girl. Hey, look. Look who's here. Ain't that Smitty? Sure, Smithfield cop. That's Smitty. Why don't I call him to identify her? Is he still on the inquirer? Got fired a couple of days ago. How will I find him? Drunk. Yes, I know, but where? Danny's bar, I'd say. What's the number of that joint? It's main something. Main 1762, I think it is. You ought to know better than that. I've been remembering about it all day. Sure. Uh-huh. You ain't kidding. Yeah, meatballs and spaghetti. Rotten. What'd you have? Who? Well, I don't think you ought to, honey. You know how it is. Hey, wasn't that Smitty? It looked like him. Yeah, honey, yeah. What do you know? He didn't come in. He had a suitcase. Must have been thrown out of his boarding house. Set one up for Smitty, Dan. He'll be back. This is the only place left in town he can drink on the cup. That's not very complimentary to me, Mr. Nelson. Smithfield Cobb comes in here because he likes my conversation. We have some interesting cultural discussions. I bet. Dan. Did he ever tell you? Tell me what? We only converse about Peter Ibbotson and the yeah, universe. Yeah, we know, we know. Did he ever tell you anything that would explain the, you know, the change in him? You mean what started him drinking all of a sudden? Yes, Mr. Walker, I asked him. He did? Yes. I said one day after he'd had a few and was getting kind of ripe and talking kind of loose, I said, Mr. Cobb, I said, what happened to you over there in the war that you came back so different? He is a different man, you know. Came back and started hitting the bottle. Just like that. Ah, uh, well, one day the most successful newspaper man in town. The next, a very unhappy person. And what does Smitty say? Well, if I remember correctly, it took him a long time to express it. You know how he talks when he wants to. A very fine vocabulary. 
But what it all added up to was... I should mind my own business. Hello, Smitty. Well, good evening, Mr. Cobb. I thought I'd drop in and have a drink with my friends. We thought you thought that. You must be planning on a long stay with your friends. <laughs> Last time, he brightened this corner for eight days. What's your beef, Nelson? Isn't it enough you took his job? I'm not proud of it. Lots of people have taken his jobs. Don't blame me for his condition. I only took the one before the one before the last. You've got reason to be sore. I'm a tough guy to follow. But you'll be pleased to know that I'm leaving the city. That's tough on the city. Newer and bigger opportunities. For me one, Danny. Poured it when we saw you walk by. Oh, I see. Thanks. To Chicago. And to you, Smitty, my love, may you be the best city editor that Stoney Talbot ever hired. Stoney Talbot? You, city editor of the Chicago Record? Yeah, I just got Talbot's wire this morning. Then I want my five bucks back. Huh? That's what I spent on the flowers I sent Stoney Talbot last month. When he died. Well, how do you like that? And I only got the wire this morning. <laughs> you know, Nelson, I always suspected that you were the victim of a split personality. But there's one thing I can't figure out. One thing? Yeah, if you've got two personalities, why do you always use that ugly one? Listen, you All know... the best in the world to you, Smitty. When do you leave? Well, since my statement has been doubted... Here's a ticket on the midnight plane. Behold. Then you won't be needing that drink. Oh, yeah, Bex. It's for you, Smitty. Sergeant Bex at the receiving hospital. Yeah, tell him I'm busy. Come on, quit playing nursemaid. Let me have that drink. He can't talk. Same old reason. He's got a cork stuck in his throat. Pull that phone. Wait a minute. Well, I sure enjoyed that drink. Pour me another one, Danny. Walker's right, Mr. Cobb. If you take that drink, you'd never make the plane. You know that, Mr. Cobb. They want you to identify an accident case. Some dame stepped in front of a car and they found your name in her purse. So what? Pour it, Daniel. You'll be along in a few minutes. I said pour me a drink. What about the lady in the hospital? Oh, it's raining again. I'm comfortable here, so what about her? I knew the stuff killed your stomach. I didn't know it killed your conscience. Well, you know now. You really ought to go. You ought to, you know. It ain't nice to refuse. Besides, if you take that first drink, you know you ain't gonna stop there. Identifying corpses is much better than spending the whole three hours here. The whole three hours? That's strange talk coming from you, my friend. What about Peter Ribbitson? I thought you didn't believe in the limitations of time and space. Pour one for Peter Ribbitson. You know, I've been coming here for five months now, and I've been hearing about Peter Ribbitson, Peter Ribbitson, Peter Ribbitson. And I never admitted it before, but... Who is this guy, Peter Ribbitson, and what's his racket? He was a guy in a play. And in a novel, too. He was in jail, but he knew how to think. So he escaped from the ugly reality of his life on the wings of his imagination. In his mind, he was able to go any place he so desired. All over the world, even back into the past. All in his mind, see? In a matter of speaking, that's how he got out of his prison cell. No bail? No bail. Just... Now do I get a drink? Mr. Cobb, I'm going to refuse to sell you one. I wouldn't want it on my conscience that you missed your plane. Here's to Peter Ribbitson. Though I go to face reality, I remain here in spirit. I guess I won't see you boys again. If anybody ever needs a job, look me up in Chicago. We'll hunt for one together. What odds do you give me? He never makes that plane. I never bet against friends. A wonderful fella. But he drinks. Evening, Blake. Hiya, 
Yes, Smitty. Hello, Smitty. Raining again, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, how does it feel to have a girl try to commit suicide over you, even when you're just one of five and the last one on the list? <laughs> I don't get it. As soon as I saw your name, I figured I wouldn't need to bother anybody else. Yeah. Where is she? On four. Know her? How can I know her when I haven't seen her? Some babe whose heart you busted. <laughs> Those dames don't jump in front of cars, my friend. They wind up marrying broken down guys like you. <laughs> I miss that guy. It used to be nice when he was covering this beat. Not much of a beat for Smithfield Cobb. Oh, I guess he figured it was better than nothing. Now, I don't know why the dames go for that guy, but they do. Even after he hit the booze, they still came around. I wonder what he did to this one. What does a guy do to a dame? Hello, Smitty. Sergeant Vick says you're identified. Yeah, where is she? She's still up in x-ray. You'll have to wait. How have you been? Okay. She should be down any minute. Smitty. Oh, I'm glad you're here. I think I've got something. Yeah, go away, Julia. But I've got a woman. Congratulations. Huh? Oh, no, I mean, I think I found a sensational story for tomorrow's front page. Some other time. But it's that woman you're supposed to identify. I've got a hunch it's a feature story. My first day on this beat, and I find a beautiful woman, absolutely anonymous, and with this in her purse. The Congressional Medal of Honor. There aren't many of those around. They're kind of hard to get, Junior. See, you're interested. It is a story, isn't it, Smitty? Yeah, it's a story. She must be some hero's wife or sweetheart or something. And if she is, where is he? Where most heroes are, probably. Oh. Did you see her? When they brought her in, yeah. Would that be the girl? Yeah. Yeah, that's the girl. Well, then you do know her. I don't know who she is. Well, who is she? Come on, tell me, Smitty. Give me a break. You're not going to write this yarn, Junior. I'm not going to That's write... That's what I said. It's taking them so long up there. I need a drink. You're not going to try and steal this story from me, are you, Smitty? Look, Junior, this is an old story with me. I'm just writing a finish on it, so lay off. But, Smitty... Look, leave me alone, will you? Oh, hey, Smitty, there she is. That's her. Come on, let's interview her. I said lay off. Grand and a half to an all. Perhaps leaving a sinking ship. Mrs. Ames, this is an emergency hospital. This is also a holiday night. We're very busy and we Hello, can't... Doc, what do you know? Well, Smitty, there are some people who think I don't know anything. Well, after all, the stupid statements you've made Mrs. tonight... Mrs. Ames, that is the most typical reaction of a neurotic. I am didn't... not a neurotic. Don't you see that you're very angry at my diagnosis? Will you listen Proof? to me for a moment, please? Sure. I was knocked down by an automobile. I was knocked unconscious. And when I woke up, my... My legs wouldn't work. I can't walk. I tried to, but I fell down and I couldn't get up again. And he said I was hysterical. I did not. I said it was a type of hysteria paralysis. All right, what's the difference? There's a great deal of difference, Mrs. Ames. I've tried to explain to the lady that there's no physical injury to cause such a condition. You see what I mean? He practically says that I don't want to walk. All right, that's what I believe. I believe the paralysis is due to some neurotic... It's some... simply repeating that word as part of your plan. Some mental or emotional disturbance. It's part of your plan to give me a neurosis to prove your point. Rather than anything physical. The examination and x-ray showed no injury whatsoever. I have so never heard such absolute drivel in all my life. If I could walk, why should I choose to crouch here in this thing? I'm sure I don't know, Mrs. Ames. But that's a very interesting question. They just left me here. Looks like it, doesn't it? What do I do now? What do you want to do? Well... Get out of here, I suppose. And go where? I don't know. I 
frankly don't know. Where were you going when, um, when you were hurt? That's another thing. That doctor, as he calls himself, he said that. Only he said, where were you going that you didn't want to go? Did you answer him? Well, of course I answered him. I was on my way to see a man. I was very anxious to see him. But now I can't. Why not? Well, I can't walk, that's why not. That's what the doc said. I never heard such nonsense in my life. I tell you, I was anxious to see him. What about? Well, I just wanted to look at him. Why? I just wanted to know what he looked like. You're older than I thought you were. I beg your pardon? I said I thought you were younger. Younger than what? Younger than you are. I am. I know you are. That's what confused me. Uh, Mary, can I take Mrs. Ames into one of the treatment rooms just so she gets hold of herself? Of course. Four's open for a minute. Thanks. What is it, Smitty? Some books to balance. Bookkeeping. Excuse me. I, I know I shouldn't ask you any questions, but well, I... Then don't, Junior. Plagiarist. Where are you taking me? Out of this fishbowl. Oh, thank you. It is difficult, everyone staring at you. On the contrary, nobody's even looked in your direction. By the way, who are you? Why should you... Smitty, how do you do? How do you do? I'm a friend of your husband. You knew David? I know him very well. You say you are a friend of my husband. Didn't you know that he was killed in the war? Two years ago it was. Two years ago this Christmas. On the 22nd of December. At the Battle of the Bulge. It was six o'clock in the evening. He was. It was a hand grenade, you see. He threw himself on it deliberately to save... They buried him there. Right there. But I want them to bring him home. So that he can have a funeral, a proper one. Just as the sun goes down. At six o'clock in the evening. Because that's when he died, you see. Do you know the hour he was born? What? Do you know the hour he was born? I know. No, I don't. Why? If I were a doctor, I'd have a chart headed, why is the beautiful young Mrs. Ames turning into a middle-aged neurotic? And right now, I'd put down, doesn't know the hour her husband was born, but treasures every precious detail of how he died. Oh, you would. And I'd be pretty close to getting the answer. Still, I call the rest of them around here. You think I've lost my mind, too? <laughs> Sometimes I think I have myself. Things make me cry. I'm not a crying woman ordinarily. Here you are, Mrs. Ames. Take this. Come on. Up's a daisy. What is it? Just something to relax you. You had a pretty bad shock, you know. I'm amazed anyone around here will admit it. There you are. You'll be hunky-dory in a few minutes. What do you do with her after she gets to be hunky-dory? Send her home, of course. That is, if there's nothing the matter with her. Well, if there is something the matter with her? But there isn't. I'll look in pretty soon. Now, don't get yourself in an uproar. I know Joe Burton. Who? Joe Burton. He's the man you were on your way to see, isn't he? How did you know? There was a list of names in your purse. His was the first name on the list. There was also a Medal of Honor. You should be very proud of that. The president once said he'd rather have one of those than be president. Really? I'd rather have my husband. That's a personal view. 
What other view is there, if you're a woman? Well, well, I didn't realize that women were a separate race of people. David was absolutely all I had. I have no family, no friends. David was always enough. That's a mistake people make. There were six of them. Why couldn't it have happened to one of the others? Which one? I keep resenting it. You see, he needn't have died. That's why they gave him the Medal of Honor. He sacrificed his life so that five of his companions could... The man you know was one of the five men who was selfish enough to have lived. Yes. I was going to see him. See them. I wanted to see them all. Why? Because I wanted to know if it was the awful waste I think it was. I thought if I could find one, just one out of the five, who was worth my husband's little finger, so that's why you can't walk. I don't know what you mean. You'd be in an awful mess if you found out they were worthwhile, wouldn't you? I don't know what you mean at all. You'd have to unwrap yourself from that blanket of self-pity and start living again, wouldn't you? Self-pity? That this war should have happened to you. That's what you're thinking, isn't it? Well, it happened to a whole lot of other people. Do you think you were in this alone? I didn't say I was. Then why don't you give David a break? David, what are you talking about? Why don't you about? give him credit for knowing what he was doing? How dare you say that he died stupidly for no reason? I never in all my life heard such you a You don't time. hear anything except the sound of your own fists beating against your own private wailing wall. Does it seem like that? I'm sorry, you've got a right to. It must be that lovely pill. I feel all floaty. I'd like to meet him. I really would like to meet him. Meet who? Joe Burton. All of them. When I can get around again, you'll have to introduce me to him. I know all of them. Really? Well, for heaven's sake, what a... Don't call it a coincidence. Oh, I, I wasn't going to. Well, when I can get around again. I can't wait for that. I have to go someplace in a couple of hours. At 12 o'clock. Well, then you can't very well trundle me down Main Street in a wheelchair in the rain, can you? What are you staring at? Hmm? Staring. You were staring at your watch. It reminded me of something of a friend of mine. Look, if... If destiny sort of walks up and says hello to you, you shouldn't throw it over your shoulder, do you think? What should you do with it? I mean, it It could be that you met me just so you could meet Joe and the others. Really? What an interesting theory. Let me tell you about this friend of mine. He's a wonderful old man. He says that time and distance are a couple of things that People just made up to make it tough for themselves, to, to fence themselves in. They're not true, and he can prove it to you. He can? In other words, you could be here and down on East Fifth where Joe works all at the same time. Do you understand? Well, not exactly. Why not? What did Peter Ibbotson have that we haven't got? Peter Oh, you mean the man who, who was... Who refused to let a prison cell make him stay put. He just imagined... At first he did, yes, until finally it became reality. Look, I'm a pretty good writer. Yeah, a critic once called an article of mine a vivid word picture. Word picture? That's right. If I could give you a vivid word picture of Joe, would you try to see it? Would you try to see while you're listening? It's very important. You've no idea. Important to you? Very. Let's call it a matter of bookkeeping. Bookkeeping? If I could make you feel better about David. If I could make you see the man that he traded his life for, perhaps you'd be more understanding about it than, than what you are. How am I? Ill, aren't you? Yes, I am. 
Now listen carefully. And try to see what I'm telling you. I'll try. To see Joe, you have to walk along Main Street. Then you make a right turn and go down Fifth Street, see? Then you cut across the street catty-cornered to get to Barney's place. That's where Joe works. Can you see it? I saw it. I saw it this evening before my accident. I almost went in, but then I couldn't. Barney's place is the modern version of the old-time saloon. But the people are the same. This is the bottom of the heap. This is Skid Row. Here's where you find the leftovers and the forgotten ones. I can't see them. That's all right. That's because you've never seen people like this. Where's Joe Burton? First, I'm going to show you Joe's girl, Katie. Without imagination, there's no reality. Not much of a voice, but it's a living. Katie's around 18. She doesn't belong in this joint, but Joe works here, so here she stays. That's Joe over there. He's not more than 21. He's a husky kid. He doesn't look like the Rex who frequent this place. He just works here. He's the bouncer. It's a pleasure to be thrown out by Joe. He does it so graciously, with style. Joe's moving in because one of the customers is getting out of hand. He thinks he can fly. I don't claim I can make a long flight, but I can take off from here and fly. Well, I'll fly over to that table there and fly back without touching the floor. You think I can't make it, don't you? I can tell by your expression. I don't say you can't make it. I simply say if you don't make it, I'll have to throw you out. It's the silliest thing I ever heard of. A man can't fly from a bar stool. How do you know he can't? He hasn't tried. But he... Now you've made me lose confidence in myself. I could have done it. I know I could have done it. Shame on you. That's the worst thing you can do, is make a man lose confidence in himself. Did you hear what he said? He's right. That's the worst thing you can do. Shame on you. Shame on you. Well. I never. Hello. Hello. I'm glad to meet you. I didn't know about you. I only knew about Joe. You can't know about Joe unless you know about me, too. We go together. It's not fair. It isn't. It's not fair that I should lose. Did you lose something? Yes, yes, I did. I can't remember just now what it was. It was. An earring. I lost an earring. I was on my way here and I had an accident. I can't walk. That's funny. Joe can walk and he only has one leg. That's why he's a bouncer. It is? Yes. You see, he has to prove that he's as good as any man who walks. Well, I, I don't know anything about that. I only know that I can't walk. He made me come here anyway. You didn't really want to, did you? You really were afraid to, weren't you? Oh, I was very anxious to see him. I saved his life. I mean, my husband did. Uh, could we sit down somewhere? I'm getting sleepy. It's the little pill, I suppose. I'm glad to. Joe's over there at the table, building our house. He is? Where's your lot? What? Your lot? Haven't you bought a lot? No. Now, you can't build a house until you have a lot to build it on. You have to have that first. You do? I thought first you had to have the wish to live in it with someone. You get me all mixed up, and, and I resent it. You don't have to apologize. Lots of people don't have any imagination. Joe. Joe, this lady would really like to see what you look like. She hasn't any imagination. I know. She doesn't even think a man could fly if he wanted to. Everything has to be imagined first, or it couldn't happen. I do have an imagination. I do. I couldn't be here if I didn't. Joe. Joe, don't let her see our house. She doesn't believe in it. You haven't even got a lot. If you don't believe in it, it can never happen. I won't let you tear down our house. I don't want to tear your house down. 
You don't give other people a chance. You don't even know when your husband was born. I'll tell you when he was born. When he died. You aren't even grateful. David died for you. David died so we could build our house. You want to tear it down. No, no, I don't. But you haven't even got a lot yet. You can't build a house. You can build a house on a cloud. You haven't even got a lot. I don't know what there is about that that makes you so angry. That isn't a real house. There, you see? One breath and... We didn't know it wasn't real. Shame on you. Shame on you. Don't cry. Please don't cry. I'm not ordinarily a crying woman. Mrs. Ames. I think she's fallen asleep. Mrs. Ames. Mrs. Ames, I'm speaking to you. Oh, uh, I didn't fall asleep. You said I did, but I didn't. I was there. I saw Katie and Joe. You were sound was... asleep. No, no, I wasn't. Don't listen to her. I was there. I heard every word you said. I was at Barney's place. I saw Joe and Katie so clearly. I, I'm sure I'd know them if I saw them again. I was afraid you'd fallen asleep and spoiled it all. Oh, no, no, I didn't. I saw the little man that thought he could fly off the bar stool. I heard Katie sing and... I saw the house Joe was building on a cloud. It's not unusual for a sedative to make you have funny dreams sometimes. Now, don't worry about she it. She wasn't dreaming. Now, don't frighten her. Of course she was dreaming. You were talking your head off. When I came in, you were crying. But you thought it was someone else crying. It was. You were saying, please, don't cry. It was Katie. She was crying because... She... Why should they make me feel guilty? It's Joe who ought to feel... Joe who ought to feel what? Where are you taking her? Dr. Morton's. Dr. Morton will be here in a few minutes. He's conferring now with the doctor who examined you when you came in. Boy, who is Dr. Morton? He's a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist? I don't want a psychiatrist. You'll find him very helpful. He'll get to the bottom of those bad dreams you've been having. I haven't had any dreams. And if I had, I don't want anybody to get to the bottom of them. Why don't you? Why don't I what? Want anyone to get to the bottom of your dream, as she calls it. Are you afraid you might have to admit that you were wrong? Wrong? About what? You were absolutely starry-eyed when you came back from Barney's place. You must have seen something If I was starry-eyed, as you call it, which I don't believe, it was simply because I was interested in the fact that the experiment worked, as it were, that I was actually able to be someplace that I wasn't. Is that what made you cry? Cry? Cry. You were crying. Why should they make me feel guilty? Why did you feel guilty? I blew their house over. Why? Well, I had to show them it... It wasn't really a house. What was it? Just pasteboard. Playing cards. One breath would destroy it. I showed them. Did you and David plan a house? Oh, no. David was much too sensible to start planning before we were ready. Of course, now we'll never have a house. Joe Burton was too young to be sensible. David knew that. David also knew that it's not the sensible people who build a new world. It's the Joes, the youngsters who think a man could fly if he really tried. Is that the reason for all of them? Because they were young... various reasons. Let's consider Eddie Pearson, for example. Edgar Pearson. Somewhere in Pasadena. He's left Pasadena. He's working in a bleak and desolate part of the desert. Will you try to see it? Yes. It's a long way. Do you think you can make it? Yes, I can make it. Just sand and sky, that's all. 
and a thirsty tree or two. Wasteland. But Eddie's a scientist. Doesn't look like a wasteland to him. He has plans for it. I'm looking for Edgar Pearson. I'm his wife. What are you doing here? We live here, Eddie and I. You live where? Over there. How do you like it? Why, it's nothing but a broken down shack. You talk just like Susie's father. Susie's father? I don't know him. There he is. She thinks I'm a fool. You're a moonstruck idiot, and Eddie's a bigger idiot for dragging you into this. I want you to come home at once. I love Eddie. Is that any reason he can't be executive director of all my corporations? They were your corporations, Father, not Eddie. Oh. She, she has a 40-room home in Pasadena. This is my home, Father. This harebrained idea of Eddie's may take him two, three years. Well, if it takes him forever, what of it? Why don't you give him a break, Father? Why don't you give him credit for knowing what he's doing? How dare you say he's stupid? He is stupid. What'll he get out of this? The satisfaction that he saw his own opportunity and made it. Perhaps the joy of playing his own hunch. But above all, the pleasure of working at something he likes. Do you like it? I like what Eddie likes. Why, if he didn't have this chance to break out of the rut he was in, he'd be unhappy the rest of his life. You see, you can't have a happy marriage with an unhappy husband. But you're sacrificing yourself, and your comfort, and your social position, and your looks for a gamble. It is a gamble, you know, Susie. You bet it is. Do you know that all financial statistics prove absolutely and without a doubt that most new ventures fail? That's what David always said. Ah, David was a sensible man. My husband had a chance to take a gamble, too. About seven years ago, it was. He could have left his good steady rut, I mean job, at the major chemical company and gone off to some horrible, sweaty jungle. Something about research and rubber. He turned it down. Good man. Maybe he made a mistake. He didn't. He was right. Why should you give up everything for this whim of his? David would never, never have asked me to do a thing like this. Perhaps he wouldn't. Perhaps he didn't care one way or the other. Perhaps he'd stop caring. <laughs> You have no right to say that to me. You're trying to upset me. There's nothing funny about that. You're just laughing to make me feel ashamed. Please stop laughing. If Eddie doesn't love you or he couldn't do this to you. Stop that. Please stop laughing. David's gone. This is what he died for, so you or Eddie could do this. It isn't fair. <laughs> I never did see Eddie Pearson. You didn't have to. No, I guess not. I know pretty well what he is. I think I know what he's like. That's good. We're getting on. Are we? What about the third one? Who was third on your list? Francis Marino in Glendale. There's a garden back of a little cottage in Glendale. It's really just a backyard. But Frank has built a high wall all around it, forming a quiet little world all his own. Frank likes gardening. He's planted things all along the wall. Yes, I see. Trumpet vines and hollyhocks. And the usual rambler roses. But I don't see Frank Marino. You will. 
What makes him better than David? That's what I want to learn. You will. What an adorable child. Cute as a button. Oh, sorry. Oh, little girl. Perhaps you could tell me. He's my father. Oh? I, I'd like to see him. So would I. Isn't he wonderful? He's the third man. His name is Francis Marino. I'm Emmy Marino. How do you do? You're pretty. Thank you. You're pretty, too. And you look very intelligent. Oh, thank you. So do you. You're trying to make me like you, aren't you? Yes, I am. I haven't any little... I was looking for something. For someone. I know. I'll show you where. This way. Would you like a cup of tea? My father says that when company comes in the afternoon, you should give them tea. But if they come in the morning, you should give them coffee. Well, I don't care for anything, but thank you very much. I help my father. That's because my mother isn't here. She is dead. Oh, I see. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. You must be lonely, too. I don't have time to be lonely. That's because I take care of Barbara. And Tony. And Eric. Oh. And Amy. And Booby. Oh. And Daddy takes care of me. Who do you take care of? Uh, no one. I, I don't have a little girl. The boys need taken care of, too. I don't have any little boys, either. But there isn't anything else. It has to be either boys or girls. You mean you don't take care of anybody? I'm sorry. You must be selfish. We were going to have children, really we were. I love children. But David thought we should wait uh, until we could afford it. Until it was sensible. David thought that children would be a hindrance. They complicate things. They use up ten years of your life. Didn't the ten years get used up anyway? Now you're being impertinent. I am not. I'm a good girl. Daddy! 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 What is it, Button? What's the matter? She says I'm trouble. She doesn't want me. Must you make everybody unhappy? I make... I? Hey, you're the one who made me unhappy. David died for you, and you weren't worth it. I was worth it, because I had something to live for. What did David have? Are you telling me he didn't want to live? How dare you? I'm not telling you a thing. You're... You're trying to upset me. Maybe so. You have no right to when I'm mourning David. Mourning David. A lot of good that does him now. But of all the cruel... Good morning, he makes you feel better, and that's something, isn't it? Now, let's be sensible about this. You're such a sensible girl. David's been gone two years now. Why are you mourning him so? After two years, what are you trying to prove? I don't know what you mean. I won't listen to you anymore. I won't listen. Where is she going, Daddy? She's trying to get away. From what, Daddy? From herself. Can't she do that? No, she can't.
Now then. The next man, Sammy Weaver. You like him, he's... What's the matter? I'm not going to listen to you anymore. Why not? Afraid? I've had enough. We still have another man to see. We have two more. Oh, that's right, two. But I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I've seen Joe Burton and Susie Pearson and Frank Marino, and, and here I am. I can't imagine just what your reason is for doing all this, and I don't care. Just because you were able by some sort of hypnosis to induce me to try your experiment, you needn't think I'm a complete fool. You were going to show me five worthy men. And instead of that, you've... you... What have I done? You've turned this gradually into an attack on me. I don't enjoy being accused of... of... Accused of what? You were going to show me five men. And all you've done is hint that, that I'm guilty of all sorts of... How dare you set yourself up as my judge? I'm not going to listen to one more word from you. What do you want to do? I want to get out of here. You leave here in that wheelchair and you'll spend the rest of your life in it. I'm not going to let that happen. Oh, you're not. Of all the officious objection of all... Just what is your concern with my life? Just what makes you think you can step in here and... I've told you once, my own private bookkeeping, that's all. I'm not interested in the slightest in your own private bookkeeping, whatever that is. All I want from you or anybody else in this world is to be left alone. <laughs> all right, Mrs. Ames, I'll leave you alone. I'm taking a plane out of here at midnight. Sit there and enjoy yourself. Whimper. Turn yourself into an invalid. A permanent, cowardly invalid. How dare you speak to me like that? How dare you? You don't want to get well. You want to stay sick. All right, shrivel into a whining, bitter old woman in a wheelchair, alone and without a friend. If that's what you want, you're welcome to it. I'm walking out of here, which is more than you'll ever do. You'll never walk. I will. I will walk. I will. I will. I will. I will. Jen. I tried. I tried. I know you did. I know you did. Take it easy now. Take it easy. It's all right. Take it easy. You are going to go away. Please don't go. Please don't leave me. No, I'm here. I was too rough on you. I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. It's me. It's all right. It's only the storm. The wires must be down. This is Los Angeles. You know it happens regularly. Well, smile, can't you? That's better. Oh, Smitty, I'm afraid. I don't want to be an invalid. You won't be. I don't want to go back in this wheelchair. I... It's going to be all right now. You'll see. Promise me you won't leave me. I promise. Give me your hand, please. Please hold my hand. All right. I'll do anything you ask, Smitty. Only don't leave me alone. I don't want you to dislike me. I don't. You know that. I'm not a bad sort, really, I'm not. All my life, I've tried to do what was right. I have, truly, Smitty. I never wanted to hurt anyone. I always wanted to do what was good for people. That doesn't sound like much fun. You are a solemn type, aren't you? You've lost an earring. Oh, I guess it was... Don't take it off. ...during the accident. I'll leave it on. It gives you an engagingly lopsided look. Sort of dégagé. Sort of what? Dégagé. Meaning free, unconcerned, unfettered. You get all that out of a missing earring? Let's go get us a bucket of champagne. What? I mean it. We can go anywhere we want to now that we've mastered the Peter Ibbotson technique. So let's choose a very difficult place to get into, just to prove we can. Well, I... I know just the spot. 
It's out on the Sunset Strip, a very shishy nightclub, one of those places where a ham sandwich sets you back $10, providing they'll serve you a ham sandwich. Can you see it? Yes. It glitters. I've selected a good orchestra. We may want to dance. It's time you started going out and having fun. Now, let me see you smile again. How's this? Very nice. Dégagé? <laughs> Dégagé. <laughs> But I can't go to a nightclub alone. I don't want you to leave me, Smitty. Hold my hand. I'm with you. And holding your hand. I didn't realize how attractive you are. You're blinded with those diamonds. I'm a bit dazzled myself. Oh, my goodness. Look at me. I hope you like what I chose for you. What a time I had with the color until I realized the diamonds are your color. You should wear them more often. Oh, thank you. What time is midnight? What difference does it make? Well, something's going to... Someone's leaving at mid... I don't know. I... Well, I... I'm sure I have a wristwatch here somewhere. Don't you think maybe they're a little bit too much? Hmm, I don't know. Perhaps, uh, just a little. Hmm, perhaps. What shall I do with it? Well, toss it in the river. I tossed my school books in the river once. No kidding. I always wanted to, but I never had the nerve. What river? Now, there's only one river. Anything else is just a stream. You lived on the Mississippi. Of course. And here's the river. See that bend there? Mm -hmm. I lived right there. Littleville, population 840. I lived right across the river from you. Right there, small town, population 840. No. Mud. Nice, slimy, oozy mud. Yeah, right between your toes. <sighs> the sycamore trees with their branches in the river. Uh, and those little flowers were with the centers you could eat. And when you throw a bottle in the river, it goes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Just think, if I hadn't taken the train to Kansas City... And if I hadn't taken the boat to St. Louis... We might never have met and been able to reach across the river. I almost missed the boat. I know you did. I'm glad you didn't. We should drink on that. I can't think of anything better. To us. Us. Mom's 26. I hope it's dry enough for you. Mum's dry champagne from Pop's root beer. Well, what's the difference? Mum, Pop, they're both fine people. Oh. Garçon! Il y a des gens qui s'imaginent qu'ici c'est un restaurant. Il y a d'autres qui croient pouvoir ici commander des dîners. Ils ont les toupets d'entrée. Touristes. Shall I translate for you, creeps? No, no. No, no, no. No need. No, no. Not at all. No need. most expensive, yay, Ingve. The sky is the Emmet light. L'amour à l'amour. With hollandaise. I'll take the same on rye. Enchanté, madame. Oui, monsieur. Croyez-moi, le chef va se surpasser. Madame, d'après ce menu, me permet de la complimenter. Nous avons rarement le plaisir de servir des véritables gourmets. Oh, lovely. And they're such big ones, too. Naturellement, madame. Vigro demande the premises. Fresh from the oyster to you. That's my cue. Excuse me. 
Ladies and gentlemen, and Mrs. Ames. Tonight we have the pleasure of presenting a young man you've never seen before. It's the policy of this establishment to give auditions to promising young performers. Only by your applause, Mrs. Ames, can we tell if you find him worthy. Here he is, the fourth man, Sammy Weaver. Relax, relax. I'm Dr. Morton, psychiatrist from the end. Psychiatrist, that means um, when your mind goes... Uh, I make it go... Uh, bloop, bloop. At present, I am working in Hollywood as an advisor on psychological pictures. That means I tell producers and directors how different minds should react under different conditions in these psychological pictures. It used to be you went to a theater when you sat down, when you watched the picture, and you relaxed. And when you walked out, you said, wasn't that wonderful? The boy married the girl. You enjoyed yourself. <laughs> That's no good. My job is to make you sit on the edge of your chair and worry and suffer and think and figure out why this should happen. And when you walk out, you should be saying, no, he, he was crazy. No, don't tell me she was the crazy. No, she was, he was the crazy. No, she was the crazy. And I know because I was watching her because she said, that is good for you. Well, my psychological picture is so different. In my picture, I show that the mind is everything and the body means nothing. I don't care whose body it is, Lana Turner, Rita Hayward. <laughs> Rita Hayward. <laughs> well, well, no, anyway, it's the body. I mean, it's the mind, the mind. That is what my picture is concerned with. And I open up so different in my picture. I open up with a blur. I think it's clear. I think it's blur. Clear, blur, clear, blur, clear, blur, clear. What is it? Rudolf, a young boy with a magnificent body, and he is walking down the street, and he watches the beautiful girls as they pass him by, and he looks at them, but all he does is he tips his hat. That's all. But you know what goes on in his mind? <laughs> Then we show a flashback. A flashback of Rudolf as he went to his first psychiatrist. And he walked up to the office and knocked on the door. Doctor, doctor, I, I had enough, enough time in the day. I, I have to have more time. I keep, I'm getting rushed. I, I have to have, relax, relax. <laughs> Nerve, hypo. 4,000 cc's, sliced lemon and a dash of bitters. And leave out the cherry. <laughs> Now, this hyper is not as big as it looks. Don't worry about that. She's not going to hurt at all. Now, she's not going in. Just say to yourself that it is not good. <coughs> Didn't I tell you to leave out the cherry? <coughs> now, just a few more gallons. It'll be all over. There we are. That's coming out now. It's all over. It's all over. There we are, see? Now, just relax. Relax, tell me everything you do from the morning till the night. Everything you do from the morning till the night. Relax. Sleep. Eight o'clock, it's eight o'clock. Get up, go to work, brush with these. Take a shave, take a shave. We go dead dressed, dead dressed downstairs, downstairs on the sofa. Here's my station, get up, get up. All right, number 47, 49, there we go. Boop, lunch. Now, get up, 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 get up
you like him. Well, I guess that means Sammy gets the job. I want to thank you, Mrs. Ames. I want to thank you for giving me my chance. I didn't give you your chance. It was David. You know Smitty, don't you? Oh, sure, I know Smitty. His name is Smithfield Cobb. He thinks I don't know that, but I guessed. He's the fifth man. Tell me about Mr. Cobb. Oh, he's the editor of the Evening Journal with a big office on the top floor. One of those crusading newspaper men, a ball of fire. A crusading journalist. Ball of fire. Know the guy long? Long enough to know the guy. Do you think it's a nice evening? I do. And uh, do you think it's going to rain? I do. I now pronounce you two in love. You heard what the man said. Shall we dance on it? Jan, you've met them now. All five men. Yes. And thank you for showing them to me. Tell me, were they worth saving? Yes, Smitty, they were. Then you should be able to walk now. Come here. Walk to me. I can't. I can't walk. Smitty, where are you? I can't walk. There must be something more. Tell the truth, Jan. Smitty. Don't go. Smitty! It's time to tell the truth, Jan. Tell it. Tell the truth. Confess. Smitty. Smitty! It's now or never, Jan. I've waited as long as I can. Don't go, Smitty. I'll try to tell the truth. I'll tell it. I never really knew it before. I haven't been lying. I, I just didn't know. What? What didn't you know? That I've been blaming five men for David's death. And I should have blamed myself. I felt guilty and I, I was trying to blame somebody, anybody but myself. I was mourning David so terribly because I felt that Somehow, that was a way of paying him back for what I did to him. I let him die with all his dreams unfinished. It was I who refused to plan a house. Well, that could have been fun. It was I who made him stay in that dull job he hated. Because I was selfish and afraid to risk my security. David did want a child. He wanted it very much. But my greatest shame is that I married him and never loved him at all. I married him for all sorts of reasons, but not because I loved him the way I should have loved him. And he knew this. It's too late to tell him I'm sorry. Oh, but I am. I've said it, David. I've told it, Smitty. I've told it. Now will you come back? Please come back, Smitty, please. Smitty. Yes, I'm here, Jan. 
come to me. But I can't. I can't walk, Smitty. Of course you can walk. There's nothing to stop you now, Jane. You can do it. You can do it. That's right. Good girl. You can do it. I'm so ashamed. It's over now. I was such a dreadful. No, no, you weren't. I ruined his life. I made him want to die. How can you ever feel toward me now what I want you to do? Jan, many a woman learned something during the war after she'd lost a man that she hadn't quite appreciated. They learned when it was too late. You were a little better than most. You tortured yourself with it until finally you became ill. Look, there's a time to remember and a time to forget. Life can't stand still. There's an old Hindu saying that that we never bathe in the same river twice. The river flows on. Circumstances change. It's time to forget, Jan. Promise me you will forget. Now then, let's see you walk. Walk, you know, right foot, left foot. Well, I, I'm still a little wobbly, but I'm walking. You're practically dancing. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. When'd you guess I was Smithfield Cobb? It suddenly all added up and I knew. Why didn't you start with the crusading journalist? Then you might not have had to go through all the others. Oh, I do want to thank you. Nobody else could have done it. You knew that, didn't you? That's why you persisted so. I am grateful. Well, don't mention it, madam. Our best advertisements, a satisfied customer. Smitty, what is it? What's the matter? Oh, you do mind. You can't help it. You do mind about me. No, no, Jane. It's nothing like that. But then there is something, Smitty. You just admitted it. You just said it's nothing like that. What is it, Smitty? Good evening. I'm Dr. Morton. I'll wait outside. Sorry to have kept you waiting. The storm has thrown everyone off schedule a bit. We have no emergency generator. It's a serious situation for the hospital. Now, well, let's see. Well, but this card says that yes, you're... Yes, yes, I know, but I, I'm all right now. May I go, please? Well, I must make out some sort of report. Just say that Janet Ames was ill, but that she is cured now. We'll talk about it some other time, if you wish. Thank you very much, Doctor. Oh, but, Mrs. Thank Ames... Thank you, Doctor. You've been very kind. I appreciate everything you've done for me. Good night, Doctor. Mrs. Ames? Yes, I am. I have your things here. Mr. Cobb said you were leaving. Oh, thank you. Where is Mr. Cobb? He's gone. Your purse is downstairs at the police sergeant's desk. You can get it from him when you check out. Uh, did I hear you? Did you say he was gone? Yes, he's left. He asked me to tell you. Why? Where did he go? I don't know, Mrs. Ames. He didn't say. Oh, the elevator isn't running. The power's off. The stairs are over there. Oh, thank you. Go out this way? Yeah. Where was he going? I don't know, lady. But uh, have you my bag? I'm Janet Ames. I was in an accident. Ames? Yes. She's the one Smitty identified. Oh. Do you know Smitty? Oh, well, yeah. He left a couple of minutes ago. D did he say where he was going? Did he go to his office? Office? Uh, yes, yes, at the newspaper. Will I find him there? What newspaper? 
The Evening Journal. Doesn't he work there? The gentleman is at the moment unemployed and likely to remain so. Well, here you are. Here's your bag. Will you check the contents and sign this release, please? Thank you. Oh, here's your medal. I was only looking at it. Uh, I don't understand. Isn't he Smithfield Cobb? You know, the journalist. Not since the booze here. He's just a souse. Well, smart enough when he's sober, but when he starts, oh, brother. I see. The guy's been dishing out a few lies. Not lies. Word pictures. Sign that slip, please. Doesn't one of you know where I could find him? Why don't you try Danny's? What's that? Danny's Bar. An elegant rendezvous for a select clientele. Down on Main, near first. Thank you. I still think there was a story there. Counting on my fingers. Uh, 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 uh. I'm closing up now, Mr. Cobb. It's after 12. Beside you said just one drink. That's the smallest lie I've told tonight. As a liar, I'm a five-star expert. In fact, I have any number of small accomplishments. Daniel, have you ever killed a man? No. Well, I have. There were six of us in a shell hole. Then there were five. You killed him, Smitty? There was a grenade. There wasn't time to toss it back. Two of us saw it, this other fellow and myself. One of us jumped it. The other fellow jumped? Sure he jumped. What else could he do? I was his commanding officer. I told him to jump, and he did. Didn't even stop to think. Didn't turn to me and say, why don't you do it yourself? He just did it. But answer me one thing, Danny, if you can. What right had I to order a man to die? Why didn't I jump myself? I was as close to the thing as he was. Why didn't I do it? I don't know. You needn't spare my feelings, Danny. I know the answer, too. Sorry, lady, we're closing. Lady, I said we're closing. We open tomorrow at 11. Well, I guess I'll go warm up a cup of coffee. Nothing like coffee to finish the day off. Excuse me. Look, you're a nice girl. You've got possibilities. Get out of here. Go home. I said go home. All right, so I lied to you about Smithfield Cobb. And all the others, too. They were all lies. Joe Burton. He's just a tough guy in a saloon. A wooden leg doesn't make a man a saint. And you should see his girl, Katie, the real Katie, I mean. The hardest little number on Skid Row. Eddie Pearson. He's not in the desert. He lives off his wife's folks in Pasadena, and he loves it. 
Frank Moreno and his kid. He's got her parked in her grandmother's house, and it's for Sammy Weaver and his big chance. <laughs> his idea of a big chance is a $2 bet on the races. And finally, the crusading journalist, the ball of fire. That's me. One step above a stumble bump. Pack of lies. They weren't lies, Smitty. Take a look at me. What do you see? A crusading journalist. And I still see all the others, just as you showed them to me. Because that's what they really are. If you look at them with your understanding and not just with your eyes. But there is one thing I'm not sure about. When you kissed me, Smitty, was that a lie? It depends on how you look at it. You're an attractive woman. Is that all? That's all. That and your... Your bookkeeping? That's right. I don't believe you. If I believe this, then it's no good. If you'd gone out and hunted all over the world for the one wrong man, you couldn't have made a neater choice. It's no good, Jan. There's something you're keeping from me, Smitty, and I want to know what it is, because... because I'm in love with you. Jan, for heaven's sake, give yourself a break. Get out of here. Go away. What sort of books are you trying to balance, Mitty? Jan, you're just making it tough for yourself. We're through. What more do you want me to tell you? All of it. All right. I killed your husband. I was his commanding officer. I ordered him to throw himself on the grenade. So that's the reason for... for this. And it explains your bookkeeping too, doesn't it? You were paying a debt. Smitty, there were 300,000 Americans killed in the war. Were they all murdered by commands? Do all officers feel this way? All officers didn't do what I did. No officer has the right to. You didn't do anything. David made his own decision. He knew what he was doing. Shall I tell you something, Smitty? I don't think David even heard what you were saying to him. He was already on his way to that grenade. And he was thinking, here goes for Joe because he's young. And here goes for Frank because, because he has a child. And for Eddie because he has that dream about the desert. And for Sammy Weaver because he has a heart full of joy and can make people laugh. And here goes for Smithfield Cobb. He's the best of the lot because he can see the hidden good in all the rest. He never heard your command, Smitty. And if he had, it wouldn't have mattered. He chose to die because, because he himself had too little to live for. So we're both guilty, you and I. And we'd better work it out together. We can help each other. There's a time to remember and a time to forget, Smitty. You can't bathe twice in the same river. It's time to forget the past and start living for the future. I can tell you what it's going to be like, the future. May I tell you? Will you listen, darling? Will you listen and try to believe in it? I'll show it to you. After all, what did Peter Ibbotson have that we haven't got? Close your eyes and, and try to see it. Smithfield Cobb is a crusading journalist with a wife who adores him. He used to be sort of mixed up, but that's all over now. The Cobbs have a little house in Santa Barbara.